Good afternoon, everybody. I want to welcome you to our luncheon panel on social entrepreneurship and inventing for life and work. So I'm uh, Chuck Eason. I'm the uh, Business Entrepreneurship Sector Navigator for the California Community College Systems uh, as part of the Doing What Matters for Jobs in the Economy framework. Um, so I'm privileged to have the opportunity today to moderate our panel, which I think you're going to find very interesting. Um, I'm going to give a formal introduction later on to our panelists, but just for a real quick introduction, uh, we have Rob Herndon, who's the Vice President of Strategic Partnerships Entrepreneurial Learning Initiative. Uh, and then we have Caitlin Sweeney, who's the uh, former event team member and MIT graduate. And then Maria Filsinger uh, Interessante, who's the 2017 Lillison MIT Student Prize winner. And we have uh, Mason Sage, who's a Sierra College student. We have three college students here. And then Savannah Turner, who's also from Sierra College as well. So glad to have them here today. And it's um it is kind of interesting. I'm glad that we have an opportunity to uh, actually have students here because usually when we uh, meet for these events, it's us talking. We get to hear from our, each other, uh, but to have students here, it's a real treat, and it gives us that real perspective because that's why we're doing our jobs and that's why we why we're here to do this. So I'm glad we have some students in some of our breakout sessions and also today for opportunity to hear from them as well. So I'm going to um, start off our first speaker and start with Rob Herndon. Now, he is the Vice President of Entrepreneurial Learning Initiative, and uh, Rob nurtures partnerships that empower individuals, organizations, and communities with an entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, he has significant experience in um, education at the university level, community college level, high school level, and uh, various leadership positions also in the Air Force as a veteran, uh, Air Force officer, used to fly C-5s, he told me. I'll turn it over to Rob, I want you to share with us a little bit about the Entrepreneurial Learning Initiative, and, uh, that um, Eli has been a long-term partner with NACI, so I see a lot of familiar faces in the room, and as Chuck mentioned, uh, a lot of the folks who have been through our Ice House training. Um, you know, I've been really excited at Eli to do the, the type of work that we do because um, I think it can, it's one of the ways that we can really make an impact in our society, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Um, but the type of work that we do, where we're going around giving keynotes, we're participating in workshops, or we're doing our training um, all across the spectrum, as Chuck mentioned, you know, from middle school up to the corporate environment or government environment, like some things we're doing in Albuquerque. Um, just seeing the impact that it's having on people and on the students uh, that get exposed to the ideas behind the entrepreneurial mindset and then have the opportunity to do what most of them are doing in your classrooms, which is ex experiencing some type of entrepreneurial process, and what that can do to an individual um, as they go on through their life. So I'm really excited to share the, share the stage with uh, some folks who are younger than me, um, <laughs> and be, because I just think it shows, uh, we're gonna see from their comments, um, the impact that these folks are going to have as they go forward in the future. And I think a lot of that has to do with the mindset that they were able to, to build up over their, their somewhat short lives at this point. One of the things that was talked about um, in, in my master's program was that complex systems are designed to get the outcomes that, they, that are being seen. They're, they're perfectly matched to that. So whatever system you have, it's getting the outcomes that it's designed to do. So how do you change that system? How do we make small impacts that can have small changes that can make large impacts in these complex systems? And I don't know if anybody could think of a more complex system than our educational system, right? <laughs> Ultimately, when we're teaching students and faculty and administrators and everybody involved with our educational systems to think like an entrepreneur, you're ultimately awakening that innate human drive for self-actualization, that they're gonna go be the best that they can become. So please keep up the work that you're doing in these entrepreneurship programs. Because when folks find that connection between their interest, skills, and ability and the needs of others, and they start trying to solve those problems of others, you can really just stand back and watch them have the impact on the world that they were meant to have. And you've all seen this in the classroom, and all of us that have been in the classroom love those stories of the students come back and tell us what 
tell us, you know, oh, you won't believe what I did, what I've done over the last five, six, seven years. It's amazing. It gives me chills thinking about it. There's times that it's happened. So, like I mentioned, we've seen it across the board from seventh grade through adults. Um, so, that being said, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to the rest of our panelists so they can describe the rest of their stories. So, Caitlin Sweeney graduated in June with a bachelor's in mechanical engineering and innovation from MIT and is a former event team lead, as you can probably tell you what that is, uh, with the alumnus MIT program. Uh, she aspires to unite cutting edge technologies with accessible design and is currently working as a mechanical engineer. My background is mechanical engineering. I love all these mechanical engineers. So, uh, as a mechanical engineer at OneWeb, uh, designing communication technologies for developing countries. So, Kaylin, let's just share a little bit about your story and kind of how it, uh, kind of your both educational path and your career path, and where you end up today. Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, as Chuck mentioned, my path to engineering is kind of unique. Um, if you had told me uh, like eight years ago, when I was uh, about to start high school, that I would graduate from college and become an engineer, I would have laughed in your face because um, I hated math and science. You, know, you couldn't have paid me to join a robotics team. Um, I wanted to be an actress, and I thought that was my my purpose in life. And so I uh, matriculated to high school, and I signed up for our intro to acting course, and I was so excited. Um, wanted to stay as far away from you know physics and chemistry and invention classes as I could. Um, even though there were plenty of good ones in our high school, and um, by what I thought at the time was an accident, what I found out actually about a, like a year ago was the meddling hand of my mother. Um, I was <laughs> placed uh, by accident into. Um, she did a electrical engineering. She did a <laughs> into a class called Succeeding with Technology, and I was furious. I didn't want anything to do with technology. I thought I was good at it. I didn't feel empowered when I did it. Um, and so I felt really bad that I was going to be in this class. And I, I went home and I complained to my mom. And looking back now, it's very clear why she responded the way she did. At the time, I just thought she was being uh, unsympathetic. And I, she was like, well, give it a week. You know, if you hate it after a week, I'll help. I'll like, sign the forms, transfer you into the acting class. It took about two classes for me to realize that I absolutely adored the subject. Um, the teacher, Mr. Scott, was so engaging and really showed me that even though, you know, in the past I maybe didn't test well or, or um, do well like in the bookwise way of learning, um, I actually didn't have a good inventive spirit. And it's my core belief that everybody really does. It's just about accessing it. Um, and so that class was sort of the first time that I had a hands-on, you know, dedicated educational approach to invention. Um, and I was hooked. So after that, I kept signing up for technical electives. All of them were taught by Mr. Scott. He really spearheaded the STEM effort at our high school. Um, I helped start a girl robotics team and then uh, my sophomore year, in the spring, uh, our local fire department came to us and said, hey, we'd like to build a uh, robot for our ice dive rescues. I come from, you know, suburban Massachusetts. It gets snowy and cold in the winter. Um, not like out here, which is great. I live here now. Um, but uh, they, they wanted something to help them go uh, ice diving and looking for people or objects who've fallen through. Um, it's very dangerous and uh, puts divers' lives at risk. So at first, our robotics team started building and we applied for the Mumbleson MIT Event Teams grant um, and we were awarded it in October of 2012, I think. And so over the next you know, 10 months, we spent time as a team developing and building this actual real prototype um, for our fire department for MIT. We got to go to MIT's campus in June. Um, and I remember walking on that campus and just feeling the inventive and entrepreneurial spirit. It was like nothing I'd ever felt before. And I sort of had it, I felt in my heart, I was like, this is really where I want to go. Um, and it felt late in the game, you know, there were friends of mine who had, you know, been planning on going to, planning on going to MIT um, since middle school, you know. Uh, and so I, I still didn't really feel like an inventor at the time until, like, after Eureka Fest and after this whole experience of being empowered as a young inventor. Um, so the next year, we continued with the project, continued with robotics, I applied to MIT, and then by some miracle ended up getting in um, and spent the next four years there. That's sort of my long story about where I got, uh, where I am now. Um, yeah, so that can hand off to Maria. As a uh, Stanford uh, undergraduate, uh, Maria won a 2017 Lemelson MIT Student Prize for work to develop a protein therapeutic for antibiotic resistant superbugs. She also conducted research in metabolic engineering and synthetic biology. She re received a bachelor's degree in bioengineering in 2016 and now enrolled at Stanford's Medical Scientist Training Program. Share us a little bit about your story and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, 
how the work with your student prize has helped you and the fact that you're a career pathway. Yeah, definitely. So to start from the beginning, I grew up in Minnesota on a farm. And similarly to your story, like in my childhood, if someone had said, do you think that in however many years have passed, I don't really want to think about it, you'll be in Stanford's MD PhD program. I'd be like, no, 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 I don't know about that. Um, but I think that the common, uh, one of the common themes is like if you empower people, that just keeps leading to more successes and then you build confidence and then you feel like you can reach the next step. And that's exactly the sort of path that I think I got taken on is I had a nice, a lovely high school education and felt like maybe there was some shot that I could apply to Stanford even though no one from my high school had gotten into Stanford in many years and then like you said by some miracle ended up going to Stanford for undergrad and that wasn't a totally clear path once I got there in terms of what I wanted to do. I didn't know what engineering was as a high school student. I think a lot of high school students don't because the traditional high school curriculum doesn't really have engineering as a fundamental pillar in the way that it does science and math and so on and so forth. So when I got to Stanford, I thought I wanted to do biology. Oh, I love biology. And then they had a bioengineering program. And they're like, oh, so this program is where you take biological concepts and you use them to solve real world problems. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. <laughs> so I declared bio as soon as I figured out that that's really what bioengineering meant. Um, and then through undergrad is how I got started with project that ultimately moved me into the level center my community. So I'm going to tell that story and then after some reflections and observations about how it was that it ended up being such a successful entrepreneurial experience. So I was a junior in undergrad and one of my professors told us that if someone was interested, he was starting up a new club and if we thought that we wanted to know about the entrepreneurial side of biochemistry, which was the class that he was teaching, then we could apply. So the first reaction that I had was like, why would I be a good candidate for this? Which I think, as educators, you probably look at your students a lot and are like, wow, this student has like so much potential. But even the student that you think has the most potential probably doesn't think that about themselves. And that's good to keep in mind. And then I tutor a lot of my students. There's a lot of students now, and I'm like, oh, but you're so smart and so good at math. But if you ask them, like, are you good at math and are you smart? Actually, when I saw the application, I was like, oh, I don't know. I'm like, I guess I'm good at science, but Maybe this is like out of my comfort zone. But then the professor reached out to me and was like, hey, like, I think this would be a really good experience for you to do. So I'm like, fine, whatever. And I applied and I got into this program. Um, yeah, he let me in, surprisingly enough. And so they sorted us onto teams and they gave us um, the opportunity to think about what types of challenge we wanted to address. And they supplied some initial ideas and then let us do our own research. And one of the ideas that they had suggested we look into was the issue of antibiotic resistance. And so that was something that our team dug into, and that was one of the other observations that I pulled out in hindsight, is having students work on problems that matter personally, and then also matter like to the world, is incredibly important, because the project was not easy, and there were so many times when we'd be up late in the engineering building, like trying to get figure out where you could get coffee at 3 o'clock in the morning, and if I didn't love the project and feel like it was worth doing, I would have just gone home and been like, oh, this is just a grade, this is just an assignment, I don't need to do this. But because I was like, people are dying of these infections and someone has to do something, maybe that someone is us, even though we're like 20 years old, that was incredibly kind of motivating. So that's an observation that I had, is like, as much as you can take talented people and have them work on problems that matter both personally and towards the larger society, I think that that's really important. So we dug in, and then over the course of six to 12 months, sort of finalized our scientific plan. We had advisors who helped us with our budget and made a pitch. And then at the end of this program, you got to pitch your company to a bunch of venture capitalists who they brought in from the Silicon Valley community who were instructed to not be nice to us. And that was another really good experience because I remember walking into that room and being so scared. So like these are people who turn down ideas all the time. But they had created a safe space. Like we weren't actually asking for money. There was no money on the table, but there were the people and the conversations that would happen um, when we would eventually go pitch and ask for money. And I thought that was incredibly smart is trying to create an experience that feels very scary but is fundamentally safe and i was sitting in a session earlier today where they had students 
pitching an idea um, and asking for funding in a similar space that felt very safe. And I think that that's important, is giving people an opportunity to take a test where it's okay if they fail. So we got that experience. We got to show off our idea to the VCs. And afterwards, the professor who ran the program said that he thought we had a viable product based on how we were able to defend our thesis and our business plan. And then we ended up getting funding directly through him and were able to pursue that project. And ultimately, the work that we did to pursue that idea was what we then applied and got the Levels and MIT prize for. So let me tell you, uh, share with you a little bit about uh, Mason, his background. So uh, uh, Mason is a Sierra College student working at his associate's degree in mechatronics. He founded the STEAM Club at Sierra College and has been part of the robotics team. As such, he said he spent a lot of time at the Hacker Lab, which is a um, major space, co-working space. It's just a few minutes from the campus there. And it's a, um, a partnership with a private organization that runs the Hacker, Hacker Lab. And I decided to go into San Jose State to study mechanical engineering and then go get his Master's of Robotics at Oregon State. And then he wants to work in R&D. So again, another planned out career <laughs> knows where he's going to be here. So, yeah, yeah, share with us a little bit about your project and also uh, your experience with it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, again, my name is Mason Sage. Um, I, um, I did um, co-found the STEM club at uh, Sir College. I was fortunate enough to pull some resources together and um, make a really unique environment where we've got a lot of, you know, like minds coming together to kind of solve some problems. Um, I'm also the president of the Robotics Club at Sir College. Um, nerd. <laughs> uh, I, I lead a youth group on my free time. I'm a member of the Fifth um, Capital Honor Society. Um, and I, I honestly, I love what I do. Um, I, like uh, Chuck said, I'm pursuing mechanical engineering. Um, I've, after one more term of general ed, I'll have a degree in math, physics, and mechatronics. Uh, those are just associate's degrees. Um, but let me back up a minute here. And um, I thought it was kind of funny. A lot of us, I thought that you guys wanted to be engineers from from day one. I know I didn't. I thought it was really unique to find that out. Um, back up to seventh grade, um, I almost didn't actually pass uh, out of middle school. I didn't know what I was doing. I was thinking about going to the army. Um, it seemed to kind of just fit what I wanted to do. Um, I actually didn't have any math background coming into, coming into high school. Um, and until freshman year, I took this hands-on class called Mechatronics at uh, Placer High School. And it totally changed my whole viewpoint of what engineering and making things and becoming a problem solver in today's world means. So I didn't have any math background. I started out at pre-algebra class in high school where they only offer it once, once a year for the, the troublemakers who just kind of messed around. Um, anyway, so I ended up taking math all the way up to my senior year and I ended up uh, finishing out with AP Calculus. And um, I, I can never have done that without the inspiration coming from mechatronics. Um, this hands-on class that really inspired me to build things, to automate things, to, to say, hey, there's a, there's a real-world problems, and here are the skills necessary to solve them. All of that, um, coming out of that class, that was really the inspiration that drove me to kind of choose engineering as a career and robotics. Um, so really, what is mechatronics? Um, it's, it's a combination of electrical engineering, um, mechanical engineering, and computer science. It's basically like robotics. Um, I think of things that I don't think of. Um, I think of drones, um, surveying uh, landscaping areas, doing um, automation for the Tesla um, car manufacturing process. That's what I think of when I think of robotics. And uh, it's been a passion since high school. And so um, now that I am in, in Sierra College, they actually have a, a mechatronics program. And here I've been able to totally critique my skills, find my passion, and, um, and I've actually finished the, the entire program there. Um, and as a, as a capital project, um, we build a, uh, basically something that can solve a real life problem. Um, I built this robotic arm you guys see here. Uh, it's it's uh, six degrees of freedom, it has a touch screen, it's, it's all custom CNC machined, it's got everything from um, uh, three printed pipe, three 3D printed parts. It was programmed um, using uh, pickaxe. If any of you guys know what that is, but I, I was able to learn these skills, and I built this thing completely from scratch by myself in about eight months or so. And uh, everything from programming the screen to the to drafting, I, I had to kind of teach myself, quite frankly. Um, 
Mechatronics gave me the foundation and, and the fundamental, the fundamentals of this stuff, and then, and then carrying on the inspiration from high school, I was able to really dive into this and, and make really applicable things. I've got a video coming up here. So that right there is a, um, it's all custom CNC, custom designed, um, uh, three printed parts. What it's doing right now is actually just a simple pick and place operation, just to kind of show uh, that it moves and it works, and it's able to find coordinates and go to discrete positions. Um, I had to teach myself drafting software. Uh, this is Fusion 360. It runs through full CAD, uh, CAD analysis simulation. Um, you can do stress analysis, which is this picture here. Every part was uh, as a purpose, quite frankly, and uh, it was a really unique project. So this is it working. Um, this is actually the demo that I made uh, the night before it was due, actually. <laughs> Thank God for coffee, man. I'll tell you what. Um, but yeah, so like I, like I was showing, like I was showing you guys, um, it's got inductive homing sensors. It's got stepper motors. It's, it's all custom CNC. It's got an electromagnetic grip. Um, it's programmed using discrete coordinates. I had to actually make my own coordinate system to be able to program where this guy goes. Um, it's all controlled via a terminal or via that touchscreen you guys saw. And uh, all those skills are, you know, what I learned in mechatronics. Um, the, the, the fundamentals of that, and um, that was my capstone project, and that was that was really unique to me. Um, that was a very complex project, and I really wanted to push myself with that. Um, the next project I did actually is an honors project over summer. Um, I did it in about two months. Uh, to be working on it 24/7, and also going to school. Um, and it's actually a robotic hand that does sign language. Um, it's all 3D printed. Um, the whole interface is all custom made, it's, it's programmed using Python, um, it's only about 300 lines, it's, it's a fairly simple code because um, the, uh, the, the, basically the, the framework, the structure of this code, I made it such that it's object oriented, so if I wanted to program, you know, another 100 more lines, 100, 100, 100 other signs, um, so it could sign ASL, uh, it would be fairly easy. I just wanted to get the framework out there, and now all this stuff is actually uh, on my website and it's free for people to take and borrow and use and manipulate and share around with the world, you know. Um, and, so, and so, again, building this project, I really wanted to push myself. Um, that's all 3D printed. Thank you, Dr. Michael, by the way, for your <laughs> research there. Um, it's all 3D printed um, and it, um, I did it for an honors CS project class. Um, yeah. Savannah is a uh, Sierra College engineering major. She's one of 229 students from 62 higher education institutions in 10 countries who have been named University Innovation Fellows. The program is run by Stanford University's Paso Platner Institute of Design, their D School, and it prepares participants to make a positive impact on the world. Uh, so, Sierra College is one of very few community colleges actually participating in that uh, program. Uh, after uh, completing her studies at uh, Sierra College, she plans to study biomedical engineering at the University of California, San Diego. That's where I went, my wife as well, that's great. And then um, plans to get a master's degree, become a prosthetic practitioner and doctorate in biomechatronics. So Savannah, let's hear a little bit about your story. Uh, well, as you mentioned, my name is Savannah. Um, I'm in my second year at Sierra College right now. But before I went to Sierra College, I went to Colfax High School. I took seven engineering courses. Um, my sister suggested I take it, and I just decided, you know, to walk in. My focus was on medicine. I loved medicine. I loved the human body, everything about it. And so that was really where I was kind of set on. But I took this engineering class, and I fell in love. So I was a little bit torn between engineering and medicine, and I just decided to combine them two, the two. So my first semester, I ever took engineering. I started designing uh, robotic hands. Um, uh, I was 14 and I applied for a fellowship at Shiner, or an internship at Shiner's Hospital for Children in Northern California and I got in and it was an amazing opportunity. I was able to see patients and see how prosthetics were being made. I talked to patients about the problems, I talked to the doctors about the problems and it was really, really inspiring about, you know, all these problems people face yet they're focused on making these really, you know, intricate moving hands when people are getting sores and don't wear their prosthetic limbs. And upon my research, I discovered that 50% of all people who need a prosthetic don't wear it because it's uncomfortable and it's too expensive to fix. 
So the average, you know, robotic hand goes for $24,000. Nobody can just, you know, has that money in the bank and ready to spend it. But, and it's also uncomfortable. So why spend the money on something you're not gonna, you know, wear or use? So um, in high school, I decided that this needed to change. So after my fellow, or my internship, I started designing a, an app that hopefully will connect to a prosthetic limb that on the inside has uh, cushions that can inflate and deflate and be controlled on your phone. So as you're going about your day, if there's a pressure point, there's a hot spot, there's this, that, you can easily just grab out your phone and inflate it, deflate it, save your settings, um, improve you know, circulation, and overall make it more comfortable. And um, so I decided biomedical engineering was where I wanted to go, so I could hopefully bring this to life and try and bring it to market. Um, so uh, before going to Sierra College, I was uh, asked by one of my teachers to be part of the University of Innovation <coughs> Fellowship, which is geared around making students the empowerment of change on campus. So I've been working with Denise Bushnell on uh, creating <laughs> some events. <laughs> Um, one is going to be at Folsom Lake College for women in STEAM and we're hoping to bring it to Sierra College um, and my goal is to hopefully make it towards uh, young females, high school and middle school because that's really where I fell in love with engineering and where my passion was even though I was more geared towards medicine so um, She's been a personal, uh, you know, motivator for me and, and a lot of other women and uh, minorities and just general people who want to be involved, with, specifically with high tech. Um, and you know, and I, I think I sort of am trying to emulate her life with what I'm doing um, in my own way, of course. But yeah, I think my mom, um, and then of course everybody at the Invent Teams program, like Lee and Stephanie and Tony, everybody who's here. Um, I wouldn't be sitting here without them. Um, and of course, Mr. Scott, I guess. The, that I had in high school and continues to be a mentor. Um, it's sort of a team effort, I guess, to become an entrepreneur. Um, so I, I, those are the, the quick list of people I wouldn't be here without. Um, I do continue, actually. It's very similar, and I, I, yeah, that's surprising. My mom is also in tech. She's a computer science professor at the University of Minnesota, and I think that like she went into CS at a time where there were no women in CS um, and she was the only woman in her graduate program or one of very few and I think she didn't really talk very much about those experiences until I got to be in STEM in college and then I'd be like hey mom you're in CS how is that she's like oh well it was and then we would talk about her experience but what she taught me from very young far younger than I was able to understand the complexities of issues around gender representation STEM was just having sort of the yoga for the status quo. So it's like you go out into the world and try to pattern what you could accomplish based on what you see around you. And she just threw away that concept. So when, when I was growing up, it was always like, don't look at how the world exists to try to plan your life. Think about what the best optimal situation would be and then go for that. And having that from like age six really just set me up to try to shoot for things that I didn't even care if they seemed impossible because that's what made them worth doing in the first place. So 
We've been chatting a lot now that I'm older about how to approach issues of women's representation in tech, and I actually think she did a good job because if I had entered high school or college knowing how hard it would be or having all this overhead of like, oh man, like I'm a woman so people think I'm dumb, I think it would have been worse than if I just went in there and was like, I'm going to do whatever I want. <laughs> um, so yeah, she, she inspired me by just telling me to ignore everyone's expectations as well as possible. Just kidding. Okay. Um, I've got actually two inspirations that have definitely shaped who I am today. One of them is totally cliche. Uh, my dad actually, uh, he's, he's faced some like just crazy adversity in his life and he's overcome all of it. And um, I definitely get my stubbornness and my, uh, you know, my resiliency, my resiliency from him. Um, and then my other uh, inspiration is uh, my mechatronics teacher at uh, Placer High School. Uh, I mean, this was freshman year, about nine years of education where I didn't even touch a screwdriver. And then all of a sudden I met uh, Mr. Anderson and he was like, hey, you're passionate about what you're doing. I want to give you all your res all these resources, all these tools. You know, I'll look up stuff with you. We'll figure it out together. And um, quite frankly, like this is what engineering should be. And um, Mr. Anderson, James Anderson, definitely shaped my uh, whole idea and warped my perspective of what it meant to be um, an engineer. And so that's why I'm here today because of those two people. So my inspiration is really my engineering teacher. He helped me through a lot of my issues and helped me really see what I wanted to do in life as well as just that I had a passion and a drive and he made me apply that to things I may not have ever even thought I could be doing today. I don't want to do a question. <laughs> because I have a better kind, of, kind of a random coming from left field question but it'll make sense when I finish because you guys are more kinesthetic learners that it appears up there. And we get a lot of push right now, myself being a younger instructor on a college campus, to put my programs online. Did you guys find that online programs and courses were more difficult for you? Or did you prefer in the classroom? You're just a perfect audience for me, so you're all in different places in life, it's just perfect. That's a very interesting question that you asked. I'm actually just about to start a part-time master's. It's got a lot of online components to it. Um, I, I think that um, for me, I really like, a lot of MIT's courses are online. If you ever want to take a class, um, an MIT class, you can go to OpenCourseWare. They're mostly there. Um, and I found that to be a really useful tool, especially when I didn't have time in my schedule to like, oh, actually attend a lecture. I could watch it on my own time and then self-study. And I think the difference there is that it requires you to be a lot more self-motivated in order to get that same um, like sort of kinesthetic learning um, that you would get in an actual like classroom setting. Um, so I think they can be extremely useful tools. You know, the student just has to go into it aware that it's going to take a lot more kind of from their end um, to make it work and to focus and to sort of self-drive. Um, but I guess my short answer is yeah, I think they're extremely useful. Yeah, I think it's hard to give like a they're better or they're worse. I think it depends on what the objective is and then how well it's delivered. Because I, in my tutoring experience, I have kids who are taking some online classes in high school and they're just trying to take those classes to like get their high school graduation requirements done. And so I think it's a lot easier when the class is online, depending on how that class is engineered, to not engage as much. And so I've seen online classes look like that, where students are using them as a way to get to a requirement and potentially put in less effort than they would have to if they were sitting in the classroom. And in that case, I just think that's sort of a bummer. But I've also seen, this is more flipped classroom than online, so maybe it's not a great answer, but in medical school, they're moving towards a lot of material that you consume on your own time, and then you come in and do problem-based learning. And that's awesome because what I don't think is a good use of time is a bunch of students sitting in a room being lectured at. I think that they can absorb that material on their own and if you develop a way to hold them accountable for that material and then the first 10 minutes of class you can hold them accountable for that material and then the next hour of class is like brainstorming solutions to a problem, I think that's how learning should look. So if you can, if you can shape an online course to have that flavor where the information consumption is the responsibility of the student and then the shared time, whether that's a physical space or an online space, is around productive problem solving. I think that has a ton of promise. So I think we're gonna have to wrap it up so we get to our next session. Let's give a hand to all our panelists here.